At Exoverland, we have always pursued dedicated builds. Trucks built with purpose from start to finish with the best components available from our partners. In this new Overland build series, we will be taking on our first ever progressive build. Beginning with entry level modifications, we will finish with a state of the art Exo vehicle with extreme capabilities. The idea is to illustrate the varying levels and price points of a truck build as it progresses from a basic upfit to daily driver to a fully built overlanding vehicle. By the end of this first stage, our goal is to make this build ready for the Pan American Highway. So come with us and see our Gen 3 1996 Toyota 4Runner Limited go from zero to hero as Tanner and I begin to undertake the project in episode one. Welcome to Expedition Overland. My name is Clay Croft, and today we're talking about our first ever progressive build. Typically with Expedition Overland, we have taken a fairly new vehicle or brand new vehicle and built it all the way up to the top notch platform that we could. Now we've had a lot of responses over the years of people asking us for more of a budget build. So this is kind of our answer towards that at first, but then we're going to take it one step further. What we're going to do is start with the budget items and work its way progressively from a zero to hero vehicle build. So eventually this truck will have all kinds of awesome stuff on it that won't match up with a budget build, but it is the ultimate build that we can make of it. So we're gonna take this vehicle, which is our 1996 Toyota 4Runner Limited, V6 with the factory e-locker in it. And we're gonna take it through three stages. Stage number one is gonna be a basic upfit. From there, we're gonna move it into stage two. Stage two, we're gonna start seeing this vehicle become more of a overland specific vehicle, but still great for being a daily driver. By stage three, it's going to be a full on dedicated overland vehicle. And you'll see us make those decisions as this vehicle progresses through the different stages. Now, it should be noted that there are a lot of different budget items out there. The things that we choose, we're working with our partners with Expedition Overland, like always. Now, this vehicle came to us from a really good friend of ours. You may know him. His name's Eric Olson and Nikki Olson. This has been their family car. They bought it in North Dakota from an older couple that had had it in the garage for some time. It's a garage find. The Olsons, being the Olsons, have taken meticulous care of it to the best of their abilities. It has been ungaraged since then, but all in all, this truck is in immaculate condition. The vehicle is 100% stock, other than the tires and windshield. I can't think of a better platform to start with for a budget Overland Progressive build than this one. We started off the build by purchasing it. This vehicle has 165,000 miles on it, but it is mechanically sound for the most part. We did find that it does have a leak in the engine, um, which is really common in these forerunners. So we're gonna be taking it to the shop uh, very soon and we're gonna get the top end rebuilt. The rebuild's gonna cost about $2,600, but it's worth it because this engine is in great shape, the car is in great shape, and the vehicle is still gonna hold its value even after it's done. We're gonna run through any other mechanical issues that we know of. We're gonna do a quick paint treatment on it and to get the paint back to the best it can be before we start. And then we're gonna send it to a professional detail to get it in its best condition possible before we start the build as well. So stick with us here on Expedition Overland. Stay tuned to the channel. Tanner and I are gonna be diving into this. Tanner's gonna be doing a lot of the heavy lifting and uh, I hope you can learn as much as we can possibly put out from this series. So we just got the truck back from Shines Autos meticulously here in Bozeman. Everything got touched. The engine got cleaned up, the paint got corrected, all the swirl marks are gone, and it's made a massive improvement to this vehicle. 
You know, it's sitting at, you know, 96 to 2020. We're looking at 24 years old. 96 to 2006, 16, 24 years old. My math is correct. There's still chips and stuff in the paint and all that. It's to be expected. We're not gonna worry about any of that. But as a whole, this thing probably, I mean, it looks 80% better than it did. So it was well worth the price. I think it was 530 bucks. In addition, we've also got the truck back from repair shop at Rising Sun. Our good friends over there, Keith and Peter, put a new seal on it. It's running like a top. It's got the perfect motor hash that you would expect out of this engine. And it's ready for anything that we're gonna do. So from front to the back, we've mechanically looked over everything. At this point, we haven't found any major flaws that we need to address past that motor issue. Top end meant we had a crack in cylinder number three and had to have the head replaced with a new head and gaskets replaced. We're at the stage where we can begin the build, but first let's test drive it as it is before we go any further. Tanner and I take turns driving it to compare notes on what we find. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna take a little spin in our Forerunner. It's the first time I've actually driven it. All right. She started up beautifully. So you can feel those tires blah, 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 right away. They're uh, older tires. They probably haven't been rotated consistently. We'd swap them anyway for general tires, of course, of course. So that's going to be one of the first things we do, like anybody would buying a used truck. Suspension is soft. You can tell it just woo 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 just going over those bumps right there. Classic signs and failing suspension is if the vehicle hits a bump and rebounds more than once. It should go through one complete cycle. Down, pass to center up, and back down and rest. If it does more than that, your shocks are probably needing replaced. Making the transmission shift at higher RPMs can unveil if the transmission is slipping. A solid fast shift is a good sign. If the shift is slow and hesitates or is too hard, then it's more signs of failing. We have no issues here. Other than just worn out tires and shocks, I mean, it's like new in some ways. It's incredible. Let's head back to the champ. Good little test run. Look forward to diving into the truck. Sorry, Tanner, I got the truck wet. The new General ATX tires got mounted at the shop in a plus one tire size. This means the new tires are 32 inches, one inch taller than the stock 31s. For most surfaces, a taller, narrower tire is more advantageous than a wide tire. Why? because when off-road, the width of the tire does not provide any additional benefit until the vehicle is buried beyond 110% of its ground clearance. In deep mud, snow, or sand, a wider tire running at lower pressures acts like a giant snowshoe, floating the vehicle along the surface. This is why Arctic trucks made for traversing glaciers have such tall and extremely wide tires. For general use, Another added benefit of a taller, narrower tire is that these tires have less rolling resistance. This translates into better fuel economy and increased vehicle range. Finally, a narrower tire creates greater ground pressure for additional traction on ice and wet pavement. Next up is to start working on the undercarriage to do as much preventative maintenance as we can. So today we are officially starting the Toyota 4Runner build process. Tanner and I, have spent some time under the frame here, looking it over. We've noticed a few things. Notice that it's old. You know, this is a 1996 Forerunner. It's, it's currently 2020. It's got some miles and time under it. In addition, it came out of North Dakota. North Dakota, like Montana and other northern states that have a lot of snow and ice conditions, use mag chloride on their roads and other stuff that really takes a toll on the frame and the components underneath. So we're gonna be going through and basically knocking off the heavy rust anywhere that we feel needs to be treated. And then we're gonna go in and we're gonna paint a good treatment onto the frame and bring it back to a good stable platform before we build anything further on top of the truck. In addition to that, we're gonna do bushings 
Any linkages that we have found, there's been a few that have cracked bushings and stuff like that, it all gets replaced. We're gonna drop the diff fluids, inspect them. We're gonna do the transmission, see if there's any signs of wear or tear or metallic stuff that could be an indicator of problems, though we do not feel any problems inside of driving it. Fluids are easy and fairly cheap to drain and replace. Even if you think you know when the last fluid swaps were on your used vehicle, try and set your own baseline for intervals. You will find this very handy further into a trip when service items are in sync versus randomly coming up for service, possibly forcing you to run long on a service interval. Therefore, we swap all our fluids on the Forerunner so we know where it has been done and allow us to inspect the fluid. Now we all know as overlanders and car people that safety third is super important. Right? Yeah. Probably. So to make sure that we are complying with safety third, uh, I'm, I want to make sure that we got the proper eyewear. <laughs> oh man. So these are the official protective sunglasses, protective eyewear of the Toyota 4Runner build. <laughs> So in phase two, we're gonna be updating our skid plates. Now the skid plates that came on the truck right now are in really good shape. So all we're gonna do is we're just gonna paint them up, make them look nice again. Not gonna really put any time into them because we know that we're gonna be putting on skid plates in phase two. If you were to just keep this as is and run it to Argentina the way it is right now, painting them up, running on them, no worries, you could totally do it. So what I just did there was just break loose the fill plug for the front diff because the last thing you want to do is drain out all your fluid and then go to open up your fill plug and it seized and you can't open it. So now you have no fluid in the diff with no way to put it in there. So top tip, always break open the fill plug first and then drain your fluids. So now we know we can get fluid back into the system. With a big trip in mind, you're going through and doing your diffs, though you may not ever swap the diff fluid out on your trip, these are the types of parts that you'd want to order two of when you do this. This is the crush washer for the, for the diffs. When we shipped to Columbia, we had uh, a diff get put on wrong, uh, the bolt get put on wrong, and we didn't have a spare one of these, and we had to end up basically gluing it shut because we didn't carry an extra spare. And these things are so easy and so small, Something that's uh, good to have with you. As a rule, anything you need for general maintenance is an essential thing to bring with you on a long overland trip. Crush washers, oil filter replacements, oil filters, etc. Don't rely on being able to find parts down the road in other countries, unless it is a common vehicle found in those countries that you will be traveling through. So we got some metal particles on the magnet. Not too bad though. It's like a metallic paste is all. And that's normal. Yep. Completely normal. Never skip hand day. Tanner moves to the rear diff, which is the exact same process. Break loose the fill plug first. Drain the fluid out of the drain plug. Replace crush washers on both plugs. Fill the diff with manufactured recommended gear oil, and we also recommend making that full synthetic. Our Forerunner takes 75W90. And basically you just fill it until the fluid starts to come out of the fill plug. And then it's always good to just give it a good squeeze and then put the plug back in. If the engine oil smells burnt, have the engine checked. If the gear oil has chunky metallic particles in it, have the gears checked. For this Forerunner, everything looks great. And with our maintenance baseline reset, we are ready to move on to the next step. Now that all fluids are changed, we tackle some rust removal on the frame and axles. Quick tip is that wire wheel attachments are an easy way to make short work of the job. Wire wheels are found at almost all hardware stores and work on any drill. Wow. 
After wire wheeling all of the bare metal surfaces we can access, our next step is to neutralize the rust on the undercarriage. This is done by applying POR15 metal prep. The POR15 metal prep requires it to be on the surface and remain wet for at least 10 minutes to neutralize the rust. We let it sit longer to be safe and give it a good wash with the hose before we paint over it. You can thin the POR15 paint and run it through a spray gun, but we found that it would be extremely messy without a proper paint booth, so we opted for brushes, and it worked great. Definitely take precautions with gloves and masking anything you don't want paint on. If you do need to clean it, you will need xylene or acetone. It's very permanent. Just gonna paint some happy little bushes over the rest here. Just, you know, you can do a little, you can do a lot, whatever your heart's content. Just gonna paint around this lovely little bolt. It's a happy bolt. And just do some happy little rust painting here. Okay, so we got it all painted up with Pour 15. This was my first time using it, and so a little went a long way. It was a lot thinner than I was expecting, which hence put down the boards because it was gonna make a mess anyways. Again, just went through and hit the really bad spots with it. It's pretty expensive stuff, so I'm not gonna get too carried away. And from what I've heard, this stuff is basically gonna cure like a powder coat. This isn't a frame off restoration, so all we're wanting to do is get rid of the rust and help prevent it down the road. There's probably a bunch of different ways of doing it. This is just the way we decided to do it. Really wasn't that bad. Just a paintbrush and about an hour. With the fluids changed and the rust removed, we will move on to a full driveline service and repair, replacing key components as needed. There's a double U-joint coupler up here that is not serviceable by a normal person it's part of the drive shaft. You have to replace the drive shaft if this were to go bad. So we're essentially gonna make the entire drive line all brand new again. This is an extreme case, obviously. Most folks aren't gonna replace the drive shaft. They would just service the one U-joint, but in our case, the other U-joint showing signs of wear, and there's no way to just service it, or we would. The drive shaft is a very simple thing most could do with a 14 millimeter wrench in less than half an hour, especially on this forerunner. So the next topic of debate is if you do the rear drive shaft to replace the non-serviceable U-joints, then do you do the front drive shaft? Now both of those U-joints are serviceable. So in our opinion, if you have the tools and knowledge, do it yourself. If you are going to have to have a shop do it, replace the drive shaft and do it yourself. The U-joints take more expertise, so if you can do that, then great. But if you pay a shop to service the U-joints and rebuild them, you're actually gonna pay more than just replacing the drive shaft yourself with all brand new U-joints already on it. Therefore, we keep on our theme of replacing critical wear items and replace the entire drive shaft with all new U-joints. Factory from Toyota. With the driveline work finished, we move on to inspecting and replacing other important mechanical components. So we know that we're gonna be adding bigger tires in the future and it's gonna get a lot more stress, so it's just easier to replace it now while we're doing the tie rod ends and everything. The it that Tanner is referring to here is the third gen steering rack. By no means is the steering rack a required item to be replaced unless it's showing signs of going bad. For us, replacing the steering rack on this 4Runner is fairly easy and makes the peace of mind that this task provides worth the effort. Some racks require a lot more teardown and significant cost, so it's up to you whether this move will be worth it. 
It is important to lock your steering wheel and mark on the steering shaft going into the steering rack where it sits so you can get it all back together the same. We thought we had it right and ended up driving to our alignment with an upside down steering wheel. The starter is another component that if it fails can leave you stranded. It's another preventative maintenance item here that's easy to do and relatively cheap to just swap out before you leave on a trip, if you feel it could fail within your trip. Again, it's based on your knowledge of the vehicle and where you are going and your risk assessment of the part. Next on the list is new CV axles. For us, we know these will wear faster once we lift it and start working the Forerunner harder. So it is another easy decision to swap now while it's on the list. So another little tip that I wish I would have done a long time ago was to get a longer handled ratchet. This is a 3 8 drive, just standard Craftsman. Most socket handles or ratcheting handles that come in kits are probably down to about here. So it really makes busting bolts loose a little bit trickier. This one measures in just under a foot. Definitely worth it. They're a little bit spendier even for a standard Craftsman. They're north of 60 to $80, but this is probably my number one ratchet handle I grab when I go to work on something, just because I know I'm gonna have that leverage with the handle to get it loose. You will want to look up your vehicle's axle nut size and purchase the right socket before you tear into your rig to replace the CV axles. Typically, they are over 30 millimeters in size and most socket kits stop at or below 24 millimeters. This will also be a necessary tool if you need to do a field repair down the road. Heads up, when you remove the CV axles, be prepared that some diff fluid can spill out when it pops loose. The reason we decided to put CV axles in the truck is because these appear to be original. Now this truck was really maintained well, it was never driven off-road, it was only salted pavement, etc. So these axles have lasted a really long time. However, when you lift a vehicle, you're going to start introducing new stresses to that vehicle. A lot of times what will happen is you'll put a suspension lift on an older rig and then this CV axle angle gets really extreme because now the lower arm has been pushed down and all that. And you go two, three thousand, five thousand miles maybe, and you break a CV boot. One of these. These give up. So it's, these are still in good shape, but these tear. And then once these tear, it flings all the grease inside to the outer wheel wells, makes a terrible mess. You can drive on that for quite a while, but if you're going to be going to Argentina on this truck, it's something you don't want to risk. So that and all of the joints that are inside of here have been under a certain height stress for its entire life. Now you stress it differently, being that it's got already 160,000 miles on it, it becomes a liability. This axle, there's actually nothing wrong with it right now. It's just as if we were to stress it and drive it hard, it might break. It's not a liability that we would want especially for the cost of these. Now, we swap them with the Napa CV axle. In the event that you needed to get one somewhere across the country, you can find it, at least here in the US, and they have a lifetime warranty. So, if you break a boot on one of those, it's actually cheaper to just go swap, pull this out, bring it back in, and uh, get another axle versus paying for this CV boot to get replaced. I actually did one of these one time when I had my original Forerunner. And the hours and time it takes to replace this boot and the packing of it, I would have paid the extra to just replace the CV axle. Plus you're getting a brand new axle when you do it every time, if you have to. So anyway, that's why we've decided to swap the CV axles. Bushings are not an item to leave you stranded, but they can cause clunking and squeaking when worn down. So we replace them to keep with our theme and eliminates any chance of future squeaks or clunks from developing. Got in nice and early this morning. My goal is to hopefully get 
upper control arms in, get all the bushings put back in, the sway bar put back in. We got new bushings down here for sway bar system. My goal is to get the whole front done today. Coil over in, upper control arms in, brakes put back together, ready to go so we can get on the back end tomorrow. So we have an alignment date on Thursday. That's our date. And get it ready to go back in. Another tip is to have a spray bottle on hand with a good degreaser or cleaner. You can use it to clean up most items and we use it all the time. We have either Simple Green or Pour 15 degreaser at the ready. All links and joint components are Moog parts. We like that the Moog joints and links incorporate grease zerks, fittings for added serviceability and longevity over stock. However, a good factory OE or original equipment part is almost always the better option. With the bushings replaced and the clunks and squeaks gone, the next step is inexpensive and relatively easy, adding a front differential drop kit. A diff drop is essentially two thick spacers, roughly an inch thick. So all you're doing is putting a taller spacer up here and it's bringing the whole thing down, thus reducing the angle on your CV axle. Some get into debate on if you need to run a differential drop or not, depending on how much the lift is. Bottom line, if you lift your vehicle at all, do it. It's less than $50, typically, and takes half an hour. It will prolong the life of your CVs through the restoration of factory component geometry and gives you peace of mind. Everything underneath, we're good with. Now, put the brake caliper back on the rotor and start on the upper control arms. The Forerunner's undercarriage and driveline components are now in excellent condition. So it's time to add the most significant upgrade of phase one. Icon suspension all the way around and a new upper control arm kit. Tanner assembles the Icon Upper Control Arms, or UCAs, using bushing grease to help the bushing press into the joint. Upper control arms can be an overlooked item when lifting a vehicle due to being expensive and not adding lift. What they do for you is add travel with a better upper ball joint and drivability. When you lift the factory upper control arm, your caster, or front to back angle, loses its four degree tilt back it requires to maintain good handling at faster speeds. The Icon UCA allows for this by changing the location of the upper ball joint to allow for the caster to stay at four degrees, keeping alignment adjustments in the green. So the new ones have this piece, so it'll go down and here so they're flip-flopped. So we gotta drive this one out to put in the supplied hardware to bolt that one in. The Icon 2.5 front coilovers go on next. The old factory shocks were completely shot, so we are going straight for the upgraded option. We recommend if you have an older vehicle you bought and shocks need replaced, just skip spending money and time on direct replacements and look into slightly upgraded shocks to save you down the road. If you don't want to lift the vehicle at all, there are still options that are better suspension than factory. Just plan it out to help save you later. We like that the Icon 2.5 shocks are height adjustable and rebuildable. They are an affordable setup that lasts years on a stock to mile build. Anytime you have something performed at a shop, do your own inspection of the work. Don't assume that another human got it perfect. 
Otherwise, you might find yourself 1,500 miles into a trip to Moab and half of your alignment bolts are missing nuts and one has snapped in half and barely holding your front end together at 10 o'clock at night. Tanner torques all bolts and nuts to factory specs and moves on to the rear springs and shocks. He replaces the rear sway bar links and bushings with serviceable ones. Since the filming of this series, we have also looked at longer ones to replace these. With the added lift, the shorter ones are not at proper length to allow the sway bar to function as it should. Keep that in mind on your vehicle as you look to lift the vehicle. Now the key with putting in new rear springs, you want to make sure that goes right into there and seats nicely. Now we're good to bring the jack back up. I always like to hold tension a little bit the direction it needs to go. Always a good time to clean up and at least wire brush any dust and dirt and rust. And then it never hurts to hit it with some spray paint, which we're gonna do. So the front and back shocks and springs are in. It all went fairly well. Definitely had some struggles being an older vehicle. Had to hack off some of the sway bar links because they just weren't coming. It's looking good. It's ready for alignment appointment tomorrow at Dark Horse. Just need to lower it back down, put the wheels and tires on. So we just got done putting the Stage 2 Icon shocks on, upper control arms, new tie rods, new steering rack, new bushings all the way around on the sway bar links, new sway bar links, drive shafts, painted the underside, so essentially the truck is brand new underneath, which is a really good feeling with that whole premise that if you were to take it to the tip of South America and back, what would you do? So I think the next step is to hit the trail and test out the suspension and the tires. We take a few hours and go hit a local trail to see how our slightly modified rig will fare on a more technical trail. We have found a good little spot to uh, test some of the crawling. Little clearance issues here. I'm going to take the hardest line I can so that we can see the advantages of what we've got going on here and potentially the disadvantages that we would if we wanted to do more aggressive trail work. Uh, what we would want to correct, either in suspension lift or taller tire, um, better skid plates, things like that. The short section is a lot steeper than it looks on camera. We are running street pressures at 45 PSI. So we slipped there, but I'll bet if we were running trail pressures at, um, you know, 25 PSI, we probably wouldn't have slipped there. Having the ability to air down and air up is one of the best off-road tools one can have with a rig. Lower pressure off-road means more flex and allows the tire to have more tread on the ground at any given time. It also makes for a better ride and reduces the chance of punctures. We do not have that ability yet in this build so far, so we are running street pressures. Okay, I have found a good rock right ahead of me, so I got the crew out in front of me. Uh, I think we can use this as a standard rock to show clearances uh, is a pretty big rock. Like even in a built truck, I'd be like, uh, can I clear that? So we'll see how this truck does with the 32 inch tire. That matters mostly on the rear axle because the rear axle doesn't change any sort of lift clearance with suspension because it's a fixed axle. Uh, but the front, the front can uh, change because it's independent front suspension. So anyway, we'll, we'll get a baseline of clearance here.
I, I think it might, because so right when you got up there, it lifted. Uh huh. But if it keeps going straight, it'll hit the pumpkin. Okay. But it may start to lift, so just ease it. I'll okay. Watch. We're good. It's clear. Just cleared it. Okay. A quarter of an inch. All right. That's a good, Just good measurement. Good. So this little challenge up here is going to be a great example of cross axle traction and probably lose a tire into the air. And uh, yeah, we can just see how well the truck is articulating with the current suspension and the setup. So I am still in four low. Rear locker is not locked. Ease in. And there we go. Okay, so uh, lost traction going to neutral. Engaging my E locker factory from Toyota on this vehicle. Waiting for it to go solid. There it goes. Okay. And right there, I have traction again. Be able to pick that tire up. Very cool. Lockers are real important. Without the locker, I would have had to go at that with a lot of speed or more speed because you either have momentum or traction. Locker gives you a lot of traction. Looking good. So if I add just a little bit of brake pedal and then power through the brake. But that's hard on it. That's what you yeah, do. It's Oof, dust. Work around. I'll go locker. And now locker engaged. Yeah. Dramatic. Picked it up there. Yep. Nice work. That looks pretty sweet. Good. Our first off-road test drive of the basic mechanics complete feels great. The Forerunner is ready to tackle most any trail or obstacle you would run into along the Pan American. Anything beyond is based on what the individual wants it's not necessary for the trip. We head back to now start on the quality of life upgrades for living out of the truck on the road. All right, well the test drive, excellent. Everything held together, nothing fell off. And <laughs> I think we can say that phase one of the mechanical side is complete. Yep. Yep. So now we're gonna close this chapter we're going to start a new chapter on the livability of the Overland vehicles. Right now, there's nothing built in there to help live out of. It's only just mechanically sound. So join us. With the mechanical component of Stage 1 completed, Tanner and I are stoked to begin with our livability upgrades in the Forerunner. Join us in episode two as we realize our dream of a budget build overlander by adding these key lifestyle amenities to complete stage one.